Good morning, folks, and welcome to New Jersey Bill Ads, first in a series of summer webinars. Um, we're happy to see you all here this morning. A uh, couple of housekeeping notes uh, before we start. Um, one is that down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there is a tab for questions. Um, so any questions you have for the presenters as we uh, go through, uh, please jot them down, and then at the end of the program, we will take those questions. We ask that everyone stay on mute so that everyone can hear the presentation, um, and also would like everyone to know that this presentation will be available um, later on both uh, our YouTube channel and I also believe Waterfront Alliances. So we're happy to welcome today uh, our presenters from Waterfront Alliance. Um, their mission are based in, in New York City, but uh, serve uh, or focus on uh, waterways both in New York and New Jersey. Uh, and their mission is to build, transform, revitalize and protect accessible waterfronts for all communities. So it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce the president and CEO of Waterfront Alliance, um, our great partner, uh, Courtney Worrell, and she will uh, introduce her team. Thanks. Thank you, Keith. So hi, everyone. I'm Courtney, and thanks so much for having us today. We're really excited to Thanks. tell you about a lot of our programs are intersecting with many issues. But before I get started, I will just quickly introduce um, <clears throat> our staff. Uh, so we have Farhana Husseini, who is here with us. She's our Director of Programs and Climate Initiatives. We'll also, you'll be hearing from uh, Tyler Taba today, who is our, our, uh, our manager for Senior Manager for for climate policy, and also Ben Regas, who is our climate community organizer. So thanks for having us. And with that, I think I will um, just jump into the presentation. So I think Farhana is, is going to be going through the slides, which I appreciate so much. So, all right. So I'll just start out um, with who we are. So as Keith mentioned, we are the, uh, we are based in New York, but we are a New York and New Jersey organization. We work actually across the country now. Uh, we have um, a program I'll be telling you about for climate resilience and ecology that is, an applica is applicable to waterfronts and coastlines all over the country. Uh, but we were started 16 years ago and at a time when there was a tremendous amount of transition on the waterfront, which I'll tell you about it, also just to give context about why we do what we do. So the next slide shows our mission, which Keith mentioned. So together we build, transform, revitalize and protect accessible waterfronts for all communities. The next slide, just a quick sampling of some of the things we do. We are a major convener and educator in the region. We have hold an annual conference. We push for public access for people to enjoy and love the water and for youth and, and educators to take advantage of it. We, we advocated strongly for the five borough ferry service of New York City, which Mayor de Blasio implemented. And we take a, a lot of credit for that service now being available. <clears throat> we are climate advocates and we also run a program called Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, which is our national program, which I'll go into. So the next slide shows the thousands of organizations that are a part of the Alliance. So these are businesses, community groups, um, New York, New Jersey, national, uh, that um, and environmental organizations and maritime industries, well, all of whom believe in the importance of a very broad mission of making sure that we have a full set of heterogeneous uses on our coastlines and waterfronts, everything from parks and recreation and wetlands preservation to ports and industry and maritime, and that all of those uses are necessary for a region like ours and for most urban and, um, and most urban areas that are surrounded by water as we are. So next slide, speaking of being surrounded by water. I love to show this slide because often we think about the New York City, New Jersey region as being made up of what's going on in Manhattan and the ferries coming from New Jersey to Manhattan. But we, we well, but that orientation that we have towards water is often missing. So just to, I know you all know this, but I just really love to go through some of the quick landmarks here. So if, if for Hannah, you click, if you click next, you'll see the, um, that that is Central Park. Uh, so if, if you think about the prominence of Central Park in everything in New York and also in our national media, 
and how small it is compared to the amount of water that our region is surrounded by. It's tremendous. Um, I, the, next, the next highlight is Prospect Park in Brooklyn, which is the one of the most visited in New York. And then the last is the Statue of Liberty, which is tiny in comparison to all of what surrounds it. Um, and yet that is the symbol of our region. But we are here to argue that water is really what our region is all about. So the next slide covers <clears throat> some of the history. And I just wanna talk about some of the history just to give context of why we do what we do. So by the 1870s, you know, the Europeans had long um, discovered th the, the region, um, displaced indigenous cultures and the Native American populations. And we <clears throat> were becoming New York and New Jersey Become the we are becoming the maritime one of the maritime capitals of the world, and this was happening by the 1870s. The next slide shows um, also what was happening, and this is a slide showing New York City, which is also representative of what was going on in New Jersey, especially across from across from Manhattan, which was the emphasis on manufacturing. And this was a this is a map from the 1920s, which showed the industrial areas of the region that were slated for industrial development. And why I mentioned this is that in the next slide, it, this is just one little piece of the legend from the map, which shows where the metals and, and metal products were manufactured in, in this map or slated to be manufactured. Um, in, the, in the map, we just went through like the red port, parts where, for example, where women's clothing were, were designated to be, to be made. But in the gray areas, which is a lot, and most of them near the water, metals and metal, metal products were slated. And if you look at some of the details, you can see that some of the most polluting types of manufacturing that was going on at the time and, and then long into the future were taking place right around the water. And that was because of the easy access for transport, which is why we one of the reasons why Europeans colonized and, and claimed New York and New Jersey for their own in the first place. So the next slide covers, it just shows by the 1930s, the maritime capital was still going strong. There was a tremendous number of docks in New York and New Jersey that, that were a part of the shipping, transport, ferry service, trade, <clears throat> manufacturing, deliveries, and, and, um, and exports and imports. It was, we were entirely dependent still at this time in the 1930s on the water for most of the transportation and most of what was happening in terms of the industrial, the industrial um, economy. The next slide shows how things started to change. So often when I'm in a, in a, in a room and I can see everybody, I will ask if anybody knows what this picture is of. Well, this is a picture of the Cuyahoga River catching on fire in Ohio in 1971. And uh, this, is a, this is an example of the lack of environmental um, laws that we had at the time that, that would have prevented all of that industrial waste from being, from being dumped or discharged into water bodies. So all the manufacturing we just saw in the previous map from New York, this was going on all over the country, especially near water bodies. And by the 1970s, the, our rivers and streams and the heart, New York, New Jersey Harbor was so polluted, but in, in Ohio on the Cuyahoga River, it caught on fire. The fire didn't take place just one time. It had been catching on fire on and off for years. But the reason why it made national headlines was that the press was there to cover the race, the, the race riots in Cleveland and the national press was shocked. And this was, a lot of people think that the catalyst for the Clean Water Act and for the establishment of the EPA was really the, these images and people seeing what had really happened. So the next slide shows what uh, is a picture of the East River and the UN from around, um, this is around 1975. And this is a picture of construction waste being dumped into a barge. Um, and actually, this was considered fairly good progress in the sense that it was no longer legal for construction materials or debris to be just dumped anywhere uh, in the water, uh, in the Hudson River or in the harbor. But this barge was going to take this waste and dump it out in the ocean. And so this was actually, we look at this picture and we're horrified. At the time, this was considered progress. 
So by the 1970s, though, what was also happening in the next slide, you'll see that we were starting to lose our industrial areas and manufacturing was leaving most parts, uh, most manufacturing centers of, of the United States, especially in New York, New Jersey region. And we had a blighted and post-industrial waterfront that nobody really wanted to go to. And coupled with the really poor water quality, the desirability of being near the water in New York and New Jersey, New Jersey, at least around this area, was just not there at all. So the next slide shows though the good news, which is that the Clean Water Act did start to kick into gear. And by the early 2000s, late 2000s, we are seeing wildlife returning to New York Harbor, whales, seals, dolphins. And the next slide actually shows one of my favorite things, um, which is that dolphins actually have been spotted in the Bronx River. This is a testament to the strength of our environmental laws. Um, and they are there because they are chasing alewives who have been, uh, these are fish that um, mig are migratory fish and they are um, being chased by the dolphins because the dolphins love to eat them. And this is a, just a fantastic story and, under and a way for us to understand this great progress that's been made. Um, and I also like to show this is this this next slide is really just to point out, uh, you know, I know we know on the Jersey Shore and all of what the beautiful Atlantic Ocean has to offer the harbor does as well our New York, New Jersey Harbor. Um, it's teeming with life, including native seahorses, which is one of my favorite um, animals, aquatic animals to point out is a, a happy, happy camper now that the Clean Water Act has been so successful for all of us. So tying it back now in the next slides to more about what we're doing now, but still some of the history. By the 2000s, the water was pretty good, but there was still very little access. The next slide shows this attempt to get closer to the water for people to enjoy the water. And this is called the banal esplanadia, where the design thinking and the, the thinking about recreation was pretty much limited to walking, sitting, strolling, and sightseeing. <clears throat> but what we believe, and in the next slide, is that there are a tremendous number of uses and possibilities for the water. Everything from fishing and kayaking, boat, boating, ferry service, but also ecological improvements. And um, that's the slide on the, that's the picture on the left side, which is a, a, one of the projects that we verified through our coastal design program, which is really tried and, and in so many ways achieved returning to the ecological, uh, bounty and, and the ecological integrity of the region and of the harbor, and we can accomplish all of that as well. As we know, though, and the rest of our presentation will cover this, climate change is now bearing down on our region. It is the greatest threat to all of these possibilities to the water. Uh, water quality is still extremely important. We still have to fight for, for clean water. But we also have to start to recognize, and, and we have been as, as an organization, the threats of climate change, not only to the integrity of waterfronts and coastal areas, but it more, most importantly to our lives and to people's homes and properties. And as we know, where water meets land is some of the toughest areas, ground zero for many, many climate impacts. But um, I want to. But we're gonna we're gonna get into that. But before that, I do want to cover a few more things we're working on, just so you know. And since we do have the time to go into some of this detail, so the next slide shows just I'm going to go through some of our priorities. So as I mentioned, we're still even in the face of climate change, we're still working really hard for open harbor with access for activities, fishing, kayaking, boating, ferry service. All of that is still really important as we're still transitioning from that industrial past. And in fact, in the next slide, it shows an analysis that the Waterfront Alliance did, uh, which we are hoping to replicate in New Jersey, where we analyzed government owned, New York City in this case, New York, New York City owned waterfront sites. These are sites that the city has um, not used since our industrial past. Um, New York and New Jersey owned many, many waterfront parcels as part of the economy that really was a part of you know, everything uh, from the 1870s until, until the 1940s, 1950s. This land is sitting abandoned and it is also being used at the same time by communities for, for community benefits, including recreation. So we did an analysis of some of these sites in New York City and in the next slide, it shows that we did identify out of an analysis of a thousand properties owned by the government, 
that there were four that really rose to the top in terms of needing improvements and improvements that would improve the lives of people who live close to these waterfront communities and are already in fact, sorry, people who live close to the waterfront and people who are actually in fact using these properties even though they aren't official recreation areas. So this is a really important goal and one that we wanna work on throughout New York and New Jersey. And it's because we still can have, even with all the things we're trying to change and prevent from happening, we can still have great enjoyment and, and community and life benefits from access to water. Next slide is to go into a few more of our, our priorities. We are very much um, supporters of the offshore wind industry, New York and New Jersey's commitments to renewable energies and to renewable energy goals, which is a legacy of the state's commitments to the Paris Climate Accords. All of offshore wind cannot be uh, deployed and, and built outside of the harbor if it is not for the port of New York and New Jersey and our port facilities. And so we and we have for a long time been an advocate and a supporter of the maritime industry and the need to make sure that we don't have real estate pressures, especially in New York City. Recently, there have been some there's some evidence that there real estate pressure. There is real estate pressure on port facilities and port terminals, which are absolutely essential for the supply chain of the United States, but also for uh, the offshore wind industry for staging, maintaining, and constructing offshore wind farms. Next slide shows that we um, also work with students. We have a, a, an environmental education and a broader uh, harbor education STEM-based program working with middle schools and high schools. And this is in New York and New Jersey as well. And so uh, we work, we, I think in total now over 6,000 students over the last several, several years that we've worked with. And uh, the next slide before we jump into climate change is we celebrate the water every year at City of Water Day. This year it's on July 15th. They are, these are, uh, this is a, a region-wide celebration. There are many, many organizations in New York and New Jersey that are doing their own City Water Day events. We do all the public, we do, we provide with our partners at the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary Program grants. We do all of the communications and outreach to make sure that the region and everybody in the region can celebrate the water and also learn about the things that we need to do to protect the water and deal with the, the impacts of climate change. So with that, um, I will, uh, and actually, if you have questions, so for Hannah, you will be looking at the questions Q&A box. And if there are questions, just go ahead and interrupt me and Tyler and Ben, and we can, we can probably answer some of them if they're relevant to answer at the time that we're speaking. So anyway, with that, I'm going to pass it off to Tyler, who will talk about our work for climate resilience. Great. Thank you so much, Courtney. And hi, everybody. My name is Tyler. I'm the senior manager for climate policy here at Waterfront Alliance. And my role is really focused on policy development, strategy, and advocacy around climate resilience um, and infrastructure and adaptation solutions. And before I really jump into some of the specifics, I always like to start with this slide um, on because I think it captures sort of our approach to advocacy around climate resilience and adaptation. <clears throat> We're definitely, uh, I think everybody in this audience is aware that we're experiencing several climate risks, many of them interconnected to each other, like storm surges and sea level rise and extreme rainfall, extreme heat. And the reality here really is that there is no single solution out there as much as some people like to think there is or promote that there is, um, there is no single solution to address all of these climate risks that we face. And so at Waterfront Alliance, we really believe that we need a holistic and comprehensive approach and that includes a whole suite of tools, which is smart policy and legislation, better planning and zoning and land use management, um, more investments in infrastructure, both small infrastructure, large infrastructure, green infrastructure and gray infrastructure, community empowerment, community visioning, and again, just a whole suite of tools that will help create a more resilient future for our region. And I also think when I say no single solution, I think it's important to note that we do have to consider some of the unique characteristics and compositions of communities and neighborhoods and residents all across our region. A solution that maybe works in Elizabeth, New Jersey is probably not one that works well down in Ortley Beach or somewhere in the Bronx. 
Um, and so I think our resilience and adaptation work really highlights some of that multifaceted um, approach to, to, uh, to resilience. <clears throat> So on the next slide, just to continue uh, setting the stage a little bit for how we get this work done and why it's so important, I want to briefly introduce the Rise to Resilience Coalition. So Waterfront Alliance spearheads the Rise to Resilience Coalition, which is a coalition of more than 100 organizations across New York and New Jersey and a couple of national organizations as well. And represented in the coalition are not just environmental organizations, but residents, um, labor, environmental justice, we have housing groups, design professionals, folks in academia, disaster and emergency preparedness, and so much more. And the coalition really spans from large national and regional organizations all the way down to more local frontline groups. And collectively, we come together as this sort of diverse pot of groups to urge that climate resilience is an urgent policy priority. The waterfront and the floodplain and the coastlines are comprised of so many different kinds of uses from residential to commercial to industrial. And we wanna make sure that we're capturing all of that together. And so the coalition really is a convener of those several diverse organizations and um, members coming together on resilience strategy, a consensus builder and an impactful and actionable vehicle for legislative victories, which I'll get to in just a moment. Um, and with a focus on elevating vulnerable and historically disadvantaged communities. <clears throat> I also think I should note that um, Rise to Resilience and Waterfront Alliance, as Courtney sort of alluded to, we've really been ahead of the curve when it comes to climate resilience, especially at a time where climate mitigation and sustainability have really long dominated the conversations around climate solutions and conversations. We've really we've been pushing for resilience and adaptation to receive equal investments um, and attention to to the to that sort of counterpart. On the next slide, you will see the coalition's steering committee, which um, formed back in 2019 and, and going into 2020. And it's now been about three years since the steering committee has met, but we are in the process, very excited of putting together the next convening um, where we can identify some of the opportunities and challenges of the work to date, and then also setting the direction for the next three to five years. And so on this slide, you'll notice a couple of New Jersey partners that we work with, including the New Jersey League of Conservation Voters, New Jersey Future, NAACP New Jersey, Regional Plan Association, um, the New Jersey VOAD is also captured on here. Uh, and then there's also some other organizations that are not in the steering committee, um, but that we have worked with quite a bit. And that includes the New Jersey Association of Floodplain Managers, the Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed, Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions, and, and some more. And so um, going into the next slide, you'll see some of Waterfront Alliance and the Rise to Resilience Coalition's work to date in New Jersey. And so to start off, um, these are just, this is not an exhaustive list, just a couple of high level uh, topics that we've been working on over the years. And to start off, we did work um, to pa help pass the New Jersey Municipal Land Use Law, which would require that land use elements of a town's uh, master plan would include a climate change related hazard, vulnerab hazard vulnerability assessment, excuse me. <clears throat> And so this would essentially go into effect anytime a town updates their municipal master plan, and it would allow for each town to better understand the climate risks that they face so that they can better plan for how to address those risks. Another item that we worked on was helping to inform and influence the New Jersey statewide climate resilience strategy, which outlines a few priorities for the state and local governments around climate action. And then third, and most recently, is our work on introducing flood risk disclo disclosure legislation for New Jersey. And uh, this is the one that I'd like to spend a little bit more time on since the bill did pass earlier this year. So um, on the next slide, I will go into some high level uh, overview of what flood risk disclosure is and sort of the impetus behind taking on this uh, legislative initiative. So I touched a little bit, I think, on the climate impacts, but just again, very quickly, New Jersey in particular is faced with threats from coastal flooding. So that means the tropical storms, hurricanes, nor'easters, but also sea level rise. Um, and all and then also some of the stormwater and inland flooding events um, that that were that we that we've seen in some recent storms like Hurricane Ida and Henri, but also unnamed storms and just regular rain events that are overburdening, I think, some of our some of our infrastructure. So flood disclosure is really aimed at and I think is a necessary tool for communicating climate risks to folks in New Jersey on the front lines of climate change, because it really helps allow people to understand how they might be impacted by climate change directly and plan accordingly. 
Um, I mentioned the New Jersey climate change resilience strategy on the last slide, and in that strategy, there is a reference to flood disclosure as a law that would further resilience and, quote, allow potential buyers to fully evaluate monthly mortgage costs and weigh the disaster recovery costs prior to making an offer on a property. Um, and so you'll see, as I kind of explain a little bit more on the bill, that is really, I think, what the aim and intention of this legislation is. So just from a national landscape, really taking a taking a step back here, there are 29 states uh, across the nation that do have mandatory flood risk disclosure requirements. And prior to this legislation, New Jersey was not one of them. So, you know, in a state where flood risks are high, like in New Jersey, disclosure laws are really an important first step to understanding how you might be impacted by climate change. And again, the goal is really at providing consumer protection and transparency, as well as environmental protection um, surrounding some of the climate risks. And so the law would require that home sellers and landlords disclose the flood history and flood risk of a property to a prospective home buyer and renter. And that might seem like something simple, but it's actually really difficult and in some cases impossible to obtain information on a property's flood history. People often uh, think that FEMA would be the agency that kind of has that information or should share that information, but but they do. And FEMA does have information about flood history across ho uh, for homes across the nation, but they're actually legally not allowed to disclose property specific information to the public because of the Privacy Act of 1974. And so that can leave a lot of home buyers in the dark and renters in the dark about potentially purchasing or moving into a flood prone home. And maybe once upon a time, you could have looked at a property, saw that it was by the water and assumed that there is some Oh no, we lost Tyler, I think. Is that correct? Yes. Yep, I think so. I think he's frozen okay. in time. But Sir Frana, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> um this show yes, so this shows that New Jersey ranks among the top states with a chronic uh, with chronic flooding. So this is what Tyler was just talking about in terms of New Jersey's huge flood risk, which I know you all are are all aware of for sure. But the importance of the flood disclosure legislation for that for that reason, and how now new, new, now New Jersey has some of the strongest um, has one of the strongest laws in the country, or will once um, once Governor Governor Murphy signs. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so this slide shows that there's an increase in awareness on the uptake of flood insurance by fifteen percent or more with flood disclosure laws. And so this is just an indication of how important this legislation can be. And we um, we know that homeowners tend to underestimate flood risks, and that's partly because of the way that transactions work with home sales, but also just that there is a lack of awareness in general of, of flood risk. The next slide shows that there's incredible financial difficulties at, 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 which I know you are all familiar with as well, but Farhan, if you go to the next slide, <clears throat> um, oh, sorry. Here, you were going to the next slide. It showed different states and where they where they um, and where they lie on this graph. So let's go to the. There we go. New York and New Jersey were at the bottom. So let's go to the next slide. There. Okay. So flood disclose flood damage um, that is not disclosed at the time of buying a home can affect people uh, tremendously in terms of their financial stability and their assets. Um, and this just shows that it, that with a standard, uh, let's see, so if average flood cost by climate scenario, is Tyler back? Yes, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I think I lost internet connection. Wow, I'm very, very, very sorry. No problem. So we're on this slide, Tyler. Okay, so take sure. It away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And sorry for missing some of the some of the previous slides. Um, but just picking up right here, um, this slide I put in this in the presentation because last summer one of our coalition partners who worked closely with us on the bill, um, NRDC, commissioned a study from Milliman, who's in uh, an actuarial firm. Uh, and this report actually provides some insight into the hidden costs associated with purchasing a single family home with a flood history in New Jersey. 
So the table here indicates the average flood damages and costs for a 10, 15, and 30 year mortgage on a home that has experienced flooding in the past. Uh, and I think, again, this is something that we all might know, but this report helps us quantify a lot of this, which is that the expected um, annual flood losses for a home that has prior flood damage is actually significantly higher than the average of a normal home. So the average home in New Jersey with prior flood damage has an expected average annual loss of around $1,700 a year compared to just $104 for the average home. And so over the course of a 15 or a 30 year mortgage, you can see those numbers really start to extrapolate to about $25,000 on a 15 year mortgage or a $30,000 or a $50,000 on a 30 year mortgage. Um, and of course, if you look at the medium and high climate scenarios, those numbers start to also balloon. And just really quickly, the report also did find that in 2021, there were about 8,000 homes in New Jersey that were purchased that were estimated to have previously flooded. And the total expected annual damages to those sold homes was estimated at a little over $18 million. And so the idea again here is um, not to discourage folks from living in the floodplain or in a flood prone home, but rather the idea is to make them aware of the additional costs that you might incur if you do purchase that home and then to take the necessary steps like purchasing flood insurance, which I think was on those prior slides. And you could see the, the sort of correlation between disclosures and uptake in NFIP flood insurance. And so um, I think if you if you had clicked through those, you could see that there is a direct correlation. And that actually comes from FEMA, uh, where they put together a best practices document for um, for statewide disclosure because their hands are kind of tied. So they've put out uh, a document that really does highlight the need for statewide disclosure. And, and that was really, I think, the impetus of taking on this effort. So on the on the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude on just the flood disclosure piece here and go through a quick timeline of, of the work. And I, I don't want to get too into the specifics of, of the advocacy, but, but happy to answer those questions um, in the Q&A portion. But we worked um, all of last fall and winter, again, like I said, with NRDC and with New Jersey Future to advocate for the passage of this bill. And this bill was championed by State Senator Bob Smith, who is the chair of New Jersey's uh, Senate Energy and Environment Committee. And so uh, in December of last year, the New Jersey State Senate actually voted unanimously 37 to zero to pass the flood disclosure bill. Uh, and then in, in February of this year, the assembly voted again in unanimous 78 to zero vote in favor of the disclosure bill. Uh, and then we got word in May that uh, Governor Murphy was actually gonna conditionally veto the bill. But this is a, a rare instance of a conditional veto to make the bill a little bit stronger. So I'm, I'm happy to paste the, the actual text. There's a, a good summary where, where the governor writes out his support for flood disclosure and just one small concern he had with the renter disclosure piece that he wanted to strengthen the bill so that if a landlord were to falsely fill out the form, um, a tenant would be able to terminate their lease easier than what the initial bill put forward. I think the, so the initial bill had, had a five times the monthly rent threshold. And the governor felt like that was too high of a threshold, especially for some of the lower income uh, communities where you may not have assets that are worth five times or 10 times more than, than your monthly rent. Um, and so the bill is a little bit stronger in that, in that regard. And then just uh, a week ago, on the 20th of June, the New Jersey State Senate did vote again unanimously 37 to zero in support of the governor's conditional veto language. Um, and, and the bill is now delivered to the assembly where it's expected to pass. And so hopefully we'll have this bill um, ready to go and into effect for the next hurricane season. And you can expect to see a, a forum that asks those series of questions that were on some of the previous slides. So this is really, really exciting uh, work. So just really quickly, I wanna shift gears onto something that has been an ongoing advocacy uh, priority for Waterfront Alliance and, and the Rise Resilience Coalition for a long time and that some of you are probably familiar with and that's the Army Corps of Engineers Harbor and Tributary Study or HATS. Um, and the, you know this is a study that was born out of Hurricane Sandy and the, the Corps sort of evaluated some of the coastal risk uh, that the Northeast region faces and identified HATS, which is this green part of the map as a priority area for, for infrastructure. Um, and so throughout that study, uh, the, the core has been working towards a plan for this region that many of you may or may not have seen the tentatively selected plan. I know New Jersey VOAD actually signed on to the coalition's comment letter um, to the core during the open comment letter period. And, and so you can just see some stats here about the, the sort of scale of this study area. But shifting to the next slide, I, I bring this up just because there was some um, recent news on HATS in a New York Times op-ed, and so I didn't want to spend too much time in the presentation going into the specifics of HATS because that could take forever, um, but again, happy to answer any of those questions in the Q&A. 
But this op-ed that you may or may not have seen was placed on June 15th and used some renderings like this pink wall um, to demonstrate some of what the core is proposing for the region. And the arguments that were made in this op-ed were that the core's tentatively selected plan, which is alternative 3B and also the middle graphic here on this slide, um, that that proposal would wall off our waterfronts. And instead, we should build a seven and a half mile long storm surge barrier from Sandy Hook, New Jersey to Breezy Point Rockaway, which is the, the picture on the far uh, side of the, of the slide there. And so we see some major issues with this approach and this, this uh, yeah, this approach towards coastal risk reduction. Um, because for starters, a storm surge barrier of that scale is really addressing a singular solution for coastal risk, and that's storm surge. And we've really been strong in uh, envisioning and advocating for a project that would address multiple benefits, meaning that it would provide the region with protection from storm surge, but also sea level rise and tidal flooding and riverine flooding, extreme rainfall, and all the risks that we're facing. So while the core's tentatively selected plan, we do feel is flawed, and again, we did submit some really strong comments calling out the shortcomings of that proposal, we still believe that this layered approach that the core is taking is a better path forward, not the giant barrier at the mouth of the harbor that isn't going to do much to protect us from all the different risks that we face. The last thing I want to note on this slide is just that you'll see the cost breakdown of these proposals, and the storm that storm surge barrier has a 112 billion dollar price tag with a 32 year construction timeline that starts in 2030. So what that that leaves us sort of waiting uh, until for about 39 years uh, waiting for this project to be funded and to be built. And we have to be a little bit realistic, I think, um, and note that not a single dollar of funding has actually been authorized or appropriated for this project. And how likely is it that we get $112 billion uh, for, for the region? So just something to just something to consider and, and maybe discuss later on. And then the last slide here on, on hats before I turn it turn it over to, to Courtney is just to conclude by noting that we do see the core as really an integral part of our approach to regional resilience and infrastructure, but any solution should ensure that historically disadvantaged and environmental justice communities are centered in the plan and that natural and nature-based and non-structural solutions are prioritized at equal consideration to hardened infrastructure and that multiple climate hazards are considered so that we're not building a solution that will maybe protect us from a singular climate risk. And so I think the main message that I wanna share here on HATS is that the timeline is massive. The core is working towards an agency decision milestone where they're seeking approval from the cost share partners in the project, which is the state of New Jersey and the state of New York. And following that is a chief's report, which details what the plan is and submit, submitted it up to Congress. Um, and then it's up to Congress to fund the project where it's almost certainly not going to happen in one go around. And so if construction is estimated for 2030, what are we to do in the meantime? And I think it's really important that emergency management and disaster professionals are not planning with hats in mind and noting that there's no silver bullet to all these climate risks. Um, and that, you know, thinking about what are the near term priorities that we can be working on as we wait for some of this major infrastructure to come online. And I know that's something we've been thinking about at Waterfront Alliance and Ben will get into some of that uh, in more detail. And so we'll certainly continue to advocate for more funding and infrastructure to come to our region, but we also want to be realistic about the long timelines associated with these projects and need to make sure that we're addressing some of the immediate needs. And so I'll stop there. And I think this is a, an infrastructure conversation is a good segue uh, to turn it over to Courtney to talk about Wedge uh, and our waterfront edge design guidelines and how that can be a tool for more resilient, ecological and publicly accessible waterfronts. So thank you, Courtney. And sorry for my internet troubles. No problem. All right. So <clears throat> we have a, so I'm going to describe one of our programs, which addresses private development and climate resilience and private development. And so what Tyler was talking about is more on the public side. But we have a program called the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines Program, which is a verification for waterfront developments and soon to be uh, freshwater waterfront developments uh, where we are, we are verifying projects to make sure that they are resilient to the highest standards for climate resilience, that they meet um, the highest standards for ecology and ecological design, and that they're responsive to community needs. So we want to tell you about this because if you are in a community or a municipality, even um, this does work, actually, it does work. Um, our verification works for publicly owned as well as privately owned 
properties, but it is, but it is an answer, especially for the private sector, while our laws are, are not up to speed yet on in, in terms of what we need for climate resilience and ecology. So if you're if you are ever working with a municipality that has a major waterfront development or redevelopment coming on board, make sure to talk to us. We can make sure to work with those uh, with the property owner and their consulting teams and their engineering and design teams to make sure they they can use our program to get recognition and credit for meeting these high high standards. So I'm just going to quickly go through this set of slides and um, then I want to turn it over to Ben. <clears throat> In the ideal world, we would have waterfronts that were resilient to climate change, where we have public access, nature-based features, wetlands restoration, native plantings. That's This picture is kind of the, the utopia and it's actually a real place. It's, it's Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, you can see on the left, it's people you can barely see, but those are people waiting for a ferry. <laughs> you have the maritime industry and ports and all of this can, all of these multiple uses of varying kinds can be found and and a part of most waterfront developments. Not every component of it, but we can aspire to these multi, um, these multiple uses and multiple benefits. So I'm just gonna go through quickly the standard. It is, the standard is, um, is cons it consists of six categories that where we, uh, we will work with a client to verify the project and the project designs in these six categories. And then we will provide the final score at the time of receiving the construction documents. So the next slide shows the first category, which is we evaluate on the site assessment and planning. So did you pull together a multidisciplinary team to redevelop the site? Is the, is the location of the site and the, where the buildings are planned? Uh, reasonable and and um, not within um, an area of, of extreme threat that cannot be addressed through design. The next slide covers um, coastal risk reduction measures that that we would expect a project to adhere to to make sure that the pro the the site is going to be protected from major impacts from storms as well as sea level rise. The next slide shows um, that we. Also, we'll look to see whether or not a project has been implementing the best practices in community engagement and public input in order to make sure that the project is responsive to community needs. <clears throat> there are many ways to do this. And, and, and by the way, this, this standard works for industrial sites and industrial sites, actually, there are opportunities for, for public engagement that are really important that help the projects actually meet community support and get the community support they need to move forward. Next slide shows um, that, and actually the next two categories are very much about the enhancements for ecology and, and, um, and ecological integrity that we measure the projects against. The next slide shows the next category, which is the protection of and restoration of natural resources at the sites. The next, the next slide is the last category where we also score on innovation. So is the is the project something that hasn't been seen really almost anywhere else in the country? Is it is there a use uh, is there a commitment to solar power and renewable energy on the site? Is there are there amenities that help people deal with the extreme heat impacts that we're going to be facing as a uh, across the country? So so anyway, I I just want to give you, there's so much more to talk about with this program, but we just want to let you know, since you are all out there and we know that waterfronts are going to, and coastal areas will continue to change for many, many years. And this is really the standard that they can use for that change. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Ben Regas, who will talk about our direct work with the communities. <laughs> All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Ben, uh, thank you, Courtney. Um, and yes, yeah, so I'm the new community organizer here at the Waterfront Alliance. Um, and so I'm just gonna kind of introduce um, our new program called Climate Informed Communities. And actually there's a lot of similarities with Climate Informed Communities and with BOAD's work. Um, so it can be you know, a little bit more of a conversation. Um, I, I added some kind of guiding discussion questions at the end of the introduction. Um, and would love to hear, you know, comments kind of as well as our general Q&A um, if, if anyone wants to share out after. Um, but I'll, I'll kind of get into it. Um, so kind of like Tyler had said before, right, when talking about hats, 
there are these major infrastructure projects planned in our region um, to you know, help us adapt to climate change to, to, to make the city and the region more climate resilient. Um, but those have these very long timelines associated with them. Um, you know, in, in the case that he shared with Hats, 39 years, um, hopefully not going to be that way for, you know, other projects that are planned. But regardless, you know, for them to be planned well, um, to get, you know, actual community input, um, there's these very long processes that have to, you know, be put into play. And so in the meantime, um, you know, our communities are still very vulnerable to the different climate stressors that we experience in the region. Um, and so on this slide, we have kind of the three main um, main ones for the region, right? Storm water and extreme precipitation, um, coastal flood risk and extreme heat are the, the main climate risks that we experience um, here in New York and New Jersey. Um, and in New Jersey specifically, you know, 53% of the population lives, you know, on the coast. Um, in New York, kind of how Courtney had, had mentioned just in the history of our waterfront, right? It's, you know, the majority of our communities are along the water um, to some extent. Um, and then extreme precipitation, while it's already, you know, causing problems is, is projected to grow um, for, you know, four to 11%. Um, however, there's also the case that while, you know, we may be a region of coastal communities, not all coastal communities are created equal, so to speak. Um, and kind of with the history of segregated urban planning in this country, um, in this region, um, there are actually, you know, different communities experience these different stressors very differently, even if they're pretty close together. Um, and so I put the kind of icon for extreme heat risk, this, this diagram, um, it's of the five boroughs in New York City. And the purple, you know, as, as the color gets darker, it indicates kind of higher heat vulnerability. And when the color is lighter, so the lighter orange, it indicates a lower um, vulnerability to extreme heat. And if you, you know, kind of know the, the layout of New York, actually, it pretty much correlates almost directly to the neighborhoods that have higher percentage of Black and Latinx residents, um, as well as residents that are more low income. Um, and, you know, kind of the urban heat island effect, right, where, where some neighborhoods may have um, experience heat at a higher level, even when the, you know, degree is the same to a different neighborhood close by, has to do with, you know, the amount of asphalt, um, the amount of trees and green spaces, the different building materials that are used. But then also when we talk about the demographics of the neighborhood, you know, maybe um, higher percentages of chronic illness, um, access to air conditioning, um, access to different resources that can, you know, cool you down, um, besides kind of just the overall urban planning aspect. So, um, as an organization that is working to improve community preparedness and build really, you know, resilient and sustainable community preparedness networks for climate change, uh, due to the kind of large amount of coastal communities, we do have to prioritize, um, you know, different areas. And so we really want to go through the lens of, you know, prioritizing communities that are on the forefront of climate crisis that have already been affected. Um, by climate change and are going to be affected even more in the future, but also have historically disinvested in and underserved communities living there um, and are home to a lot of marginalized groups. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, and so, right, so this kind of shows our, our big goals for climate informed communities twofold. So the first one, like I said, being prepared for climate stresses and disasters, but then the second one also being involved in the development of infrastructure plans. Um, so on the neighborhood level, as well as, you know, city level, state level. Um, and I put the kind of climate change resilience strategy put together by the state of New Jersey on this slide, because actually New Jersey, um, you know, and New York too, are really leaders in this sort of work. Um, and, you know, for example, there was this landmark environmental justice law passed by New, uh, New Jersey, where it was the first state required to issue denials to you know, a facility plan or development plan that would be unable to avoid having a disproportionate effect on an environmental justice community or you know, overburdened community. So maybe a community that has you know, over 35% low income residents, 40% um, you know, people of color. However, as we know, not every plan um, actually you know, becomes realized to, to the full extent. And so even you know, in this resilience strategy and, and the different plans that New York City has put together as well, even if it's 
you know, community engagement is prioritized, if, if we want to make sure that our resilience, um, resiliency measures and infrastructure projects are, are really working for everyone, it's not always necessarily going to happen that way. So um, Waterfront Alliance is really hoping to advocate um, to really make sure that those um, strategies are implemented effectively and, you know, with the lens of equity. Um, and also to kind of help to implement those strategies when the resources are made available. Um, and I can kind of get into that in the next slide. So here we just kind of um, have, have listed our kind of immediate priorities for this program and then our long-term goals. Um, so actually I'll, I'll kind of start with the long-term, right? Um, like I had said before, um, understanding of long-term threats um, you know, that just means climate risk in general, um, you know, really in increasing community understanding of extreme heat, um, precipitation that these events are going to become more intense and more frequent as time goes on, and then engagement in local infrastructure solutions and advocating for them in your direct neighborhood. Um, but then on the immediate side, right, um, actually, there are resources that are being created and, and have already been created and maybe been in use for some time. Um, I have like the the LIHEAP program here as an example, which is a program where, you know, if you're in a low-income household, you can have your heat or cooling costs subsidized. Um, so in New Jersey, this is a statewide program. Um, in New York, we have something similar. Um, but I come up from a public legal services background and have done extensive work, um, you know, connecting clients with different government programs. And oftentimes they're so heavily bureaucratized and there's so many different barriers to access that it's actually very difficult. So not only do we need to make sure that the resources that are being created on the state and city level are effective in actually addressing the, the issues and concerns that we have that are climate related, they also need to be accessible um, and people need to be made aware of them. Um, and that kind of goes hand in hand, right, with also just general understanding of evacuation protocol, um, of extreme weather preparedness. And um, I know that VOAD, you know, this is kind of your bread and butter um, of, of building kind of resilient community um, preparedness. So, um, so yeah, excited to hear your comments about that later. Um, and then I think I have just one more slide here, um, which is, yes, just kind of going more into the existing resources, right? So on the left and the right, <clears throat> um, we have two examples of Waterfront Alliance resources. So um, on the left, we have our Climate Resilience Literacy Handbook. This is a resource that we're hoping to promote um, further through this program. Um, and it has a lot of kind of vocabulary um, to really introduce people to the vocabulary that's used in these infrastructure projects um, and kind of these planning projects as a whole, as well as um, climate resiliency vocabulary. Um, so that people can more, you know, be, be able to engage um, more readily in these conversations. And then our extreme weather fact sheet on the right, um, you know, also has a kind of general vocabulary about uh, these different disasters, as well as information um, on resources and, and how to better prepare yourself um, for these disasters. Um, and I think it's important to note that Waterfront Alliance, you know, we are a convener. Um, like Tyler said, with Rights Resilience Coalition, and, and as Courtney has said, we have all these various alliance partners. And so while we are, you know, a bi-regional organization, we have a large scope of our work, we also have all these partners that really work directly with one neighborhood or one community or one, you know, one area. Um, and so we're really hoping to be able to use our resources and our, you know, network to really amplify the work that those groups are already doing on this front while kind of, you know, hoping to to support it and 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 as well through our own programming um and in the middle i just kind of have examples of national state and local resources um, that are already in practice right so um the flood insurance program um, know your tides right as a new jersey state um, initiative um, to help people understand better um their their kind of flooding risk um and Again, kind of while those programs are great in and of themselves, you know, people need to know about them. And then maybe if even every citizen in New Jersey knows about these programs, they might not be accessible in every way. Um, you know, language access is a, a big barrier um, to this sort of information. 
um, you know, among technology uh, and, and many others. So that's kind of the work that we're hoping to really do and to then influence, you know, our other work with Wedge and with Rice Resilience Coalition as well. Um, so I think on the next slide, I have kind of some guiding questions. Um, I know we're a bit of a smaller group, no pressure at all to chime in. Um, and I think we can kind of integrate this into general Q&A um, if people have other questions just related to the rest of the presentation. But um, four, four that I kind of wrote out were, um, what do you believe are the greatest barriers to access to emergency preparedness resources in the communities you serve? Um, as a convener of organizations focused on building resilient communities, how do you see the future of emergency and community preparedness in New Jersey? How can other regions learn from NJ Vilad's work, successes and lessons learned? Um, and what resources do you think are most lacking for community preparedness in New Jersey regarding climate stressors? Um, and yeah, um, I guess I'll, I'll hand it over. Okay, is anyone want to venture some answers to these questions? I always like to hear everybody else's answers. I know we're a small group, um, but we have some people on here with big minds. So chime in. And nobody wants to speak. <laughs> hey, hey Brian. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you fine. Great. Um, for answering the first question, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it's knowledge. It's getting, it's getting the good word out onto the street that there are some uh, organizations with big brains like everyone on this call who kind of know what they're doing and really educating not just those uh, individuals and departments at the municipal level that we actually are here to help, but it's also getting that word out onto the street to the people who are living in those vulnerable neighborhoods. Uh, and I found through our work that has been the biggest battle that we've had to fight. Um, right, right, wrong or other, but but knowledge and education of of the residents is, the, I think, the biggest biggest barrier. Yeah, I think that's very <laughs> very true, Brian. Anyone else? So I would I would agree with Brian. It, it's it's actually you know tying. I call it trusted messengers, right? Working with communities uh, down to a neighborhood level and actually, you know, seeing what assets are in those, you know, community from, from our perspective uh, here at New Jersey VOAD is, is that we know that um, resilient communities are connected communities. So they're aware of what their assets are. They're aware of the environment that they're in. Um, they're the experts in that particular neighborhood. Um, so, so we've changed our approach and um, certainly from the VOAD perspective nationally, um, you know, uh, the VOAD movement started really in, in coordinating response and uh, recovery in the NGO sector. And um, just like the emergency managers, you know, we, we would move resources to the five or six major uh, disasters around the country. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. Um, you know, quite frankly, in New Jersey, um, our Ida Declaration was the 80th open disaster um, declaration for 2021. That was on September 1st. So that wasn't even the, the complete uh, picture for the year. So it's much more about community preparedness, uh, making sure that um, communities are aware and working together. Um, we, we talk a lot about um, not focusing on preparing specifically for disaster, but for preparing for the everyday life and challenges that a community has, right? And that includes climate challenges. Um, but we see, you know, climate change affecting uh, warming and cooling shelters. We see the, the sea level rise, a lot of sunny day flooding here in New Jersey and a lot of our neighborhoods. Our urban areas are particularly uh, due to aging infrastructure unprepared, right? And we saw that in Ida. So we're learning, 
um, and changing um, our approach. Um, we're still working with our partners. We're still very close with FEMA and, and our state emergency management community. Uh, but we're also trying to put a lot of effort into actually working down to that neighborhood level, um, helping them to see um, that, in fact, um, you know, every day somebody is hungry, every day somebody is a housing uh, disaster, environmental, racial, um, economic injustices exist in all our communities, and there are people working on that. Um, so it's it's about harnessing that expertise and harnessing their, their kind of... Um, desire for a good life in their community, right? And, and, and seeing how we can put resources there to help. I, I think um, how we affect, we are probably the only um, VOAD organization in the country that I know of uh, on a, as far as a state or territory organization that is specifically involved in, in climate change, both uh, with our you know, work with RISE and, and Waterfront Alliance, but also um, with um, our Coastal Resiliency Coalition, um, the Blaustein School uh, of Rutgers, the, their Climate Change Alliance. We, we've been involved in them for many years because, you know, frankly, from Sandy forward, we saw the impacts that this is, was having on our community. Um, and I think that together, um, we, we have all the answers, right? You're working with these community people. But it is, it's harder work. It's harder work than just responding, if you will, to a community's disaster. It's about long-term relationships and, and working on these very long-term problems. Anybody else? Okay, Dan, not many participants today and everybody's quiet. <laughs> But I'm sure this is, I, I love these questions because I think these are questions that um, all of us who are kind of working in the sector or across this sector, they're great questions for us to answer and keep in mind. Okay, um, any other just general questions for anybody who presented today? A general question. Um, I think uh, thank you guys so much for this presentation. It's great to hear what's been going on and seeing like the real results of your work. Um, so thank you so much. It's exciting. Um, um, I feel like around this topic, it, it can be a lot of trigger words and, and be very politicized. Um, and so I'm wondering if in your work, you've seen a shift even in like the government partners or municipalities that you're working in, do you see that people are starting to get the message and that this is something that they really need to deal with? Or do you still see a lot of pushback um, from their side that it's still a, we're not sure if we really want to talk about this yet? I'm happy to take a first crack at that answer. Um, so I think in my experience with in, in working with some of the legislators in, in both states, um, on, on flood disclosure, but also on, on other bills related to climate or related to the environment, I I don't think there's as much pushback as probably there there was uh, a few years ago. I think it's becoming very clear to to the you know the elected officials, but also to the state agencies and the municipalities that this is a pressing issue, not just from an economic standpoint, which I think has always been kind of the framework of trying to bake it into what does this mean for for us in the future mm -hmm. and the spending and um, but now I think you're you're starting to see it happen so frequently that residents and constituents are concerned about the future of their neighborhoods and of their communities, and they're hearing that. I think elected officials and state and city representatives are hearing that. And so i I do think there's an opportunity now more than there probably has been in the past to really get some some good policy and and planning underway. And we've seen examples of that. I mean, I, I'm not we haven't been as involved, but I know New Jersey has, made some strides on an inland flood protection rule and something to the extent of elevating uh, six feet above the sea level rise projections. I mean, those are some really progressive standards that I, I don't think exist really anywhere else in the nation. Um, and so New Jersey has been really a strong leader and I think doesn't get enough credit actually for a lot of the great climate work and that, that they're doing. New Jersey never gets enough credit. I, I, I really you know, agree. No, really. We're always the underdog. <laughs> we had, you did that at our conference, actually. Yes, we had, I, we had a, a panel called New Jersey as the climate leader for the nation. So, <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
No, yeah. So I think just just to answer your your question, Linda, I do think that there's been uh, a a shift. And I mean, I mean, you know, I'll caveat by saying certainly when when working on the disclosure bill, for example, we did have some pushback from folks about you know what would this mean for property values and things like that. And I think there is still a little bit of a mindset um, that that needs to change. And the response, our response to that was was really that are those properties overvalued uh, because they're along the water? Uh, and then, you know, are you, should, should you be passing the buck off to somebody else? And so there is still a little bit, I think, of foundational awareness and knowledge that, that has to be done, but I, I do think it's gotten a, a lot better. And, you know, I'm not speaking from years and years of experience, obviously, so I'm happy to let, you know, Courtney or, or others also chime in, but I think my experience has been pretty positive in, in at least in the last few years. Thanks, Tyler. We do have a question in the chat, um, in the in the Q and A. I'll just I'll read it out, and uh, and you know, Courtney, Tyler, Ben, if if you have thoughts, please feel free to chime in. Um, are there any aspects of these projects that focus on the needs of the over sixty population? For example, impacts on over fifty five plus, assisted living, and continuing care communities and their residents. Well, so I, I, um, so first of all, we're we're very aware of <clears throat> of the need, the the special considerations and and the um, the impacts of major uh, disasters and other events on on people over fifty five. Um, and so I just so I think I'll let Ben say a few words about it. But we just to let you know also like. We are just getting our our direct community work off the ground, and so I think this is a really great question, and also one that we're we're thinking about too. So I don't know, Ben, if you want to say a few words about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think so. Kind of like uh, what what I had said about how some of these you know resources um, on the state or, or city level exist, um, they haven't really been flushed out in a way that accurately serves the populations that may need the most. Um, so an example of this is, you know, there's a lot of cooling centers um, that are, you know, open kind of throughout the region when there's extreme heat events. And also New York kind of piloted this um, free air conditioner program that I know some organizations in New Jersey do as well. Um, and oftentimes, you know, seniors are uh, more vulnerable to extreme heat, right, than, than the younger air population. Um, but those programs aren't necessarily actually developed in a way that makes it really accessible for older folks to actually apply and, and get those benefits, you know, in a more easy way. Um, and so I think that that's kind of has been our goal, right, is that we're, we're not just kind of taking a resource um, that's being made available and then saying, okay, you know, this is what this is what we're being given. Um, you know, everyone please apply, make use of it, but actually really hoping to provide feedback um, to make those better um, for, you know, every demographic, right? For all ages, um, for, you know, every language group, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that also is, important for us to remember too, and we're partnering with different organizations in our alliance group, right? Um, that we're also making sure that, you know, the different stakeholders that represent those groups um, are also, you know, being um, involved. Yeah, I think that's an interesting perspective of Ben that, that you raised about, you know, so on my experience and um, Joanne was with me just last week, uh, where we're meeting with a focus group from um, representing a, a specific, you know, um, class of folks. And um, this question was about seniors, and I can relate to that because I fit in that demographic, uh, but um, just barely, just so you know. Um, you know, I think when we talk to folks, overall, the the thing is always about communication, right? Is Is that it's about, well, we can't trust what we see on the internet and so on and so forth. So it is to me, about, um, you know, especially for groups like Waterfront and New Jersey VOAD, where we're trying to be the connector, right? We're trying to tie these resources together. There are a lot of programs 
um, for various groups, um, you know, based on economics and, you, you know, you're right down to your, to your affinity for certain things, right, um, that you can qualify for. But if people don't know about the available programs, and if they don't know where they can get help, um, then the program is not successful. So I think it's really critical, the work that we do um, in just becoming trusted messengers, establishing those relationships with community organizations and allowing them or providing a platform for them to get to know each other and see where they can collaborate um, and get the word out to folks, especially our vulnerable and marginalized communities, uh, because they're not necessarily getting the same information that other folks are getting, right? Okay, are there any other questions? I think we went a little over, but it's been great. Um, I wanna thank um, Waterfront Alliance, Courtney, uh, Ben, Tyler, uh, Rahana, thank you for keeping the slides <laughs> on track for all of us. Um, it, was, it was a great discussion today. And I think that um, you, you know, hopefully a lot of people will be able to see this on YouTube because this is valuable information. Um, and I, again, I appreciate, and it was pretty short notice, I know, uh, to get you on for this one. Um, and I also want to invite everyone back um, next month. Um, next month, our topic will be um, tools and tips uh, around some technology that uh, we have available here at New Jersey VOAD, um, you know, around our volunteer and donation platforms, and also um, a, a new app that we're, we're pretty excited about as well. So. I hope that you will join us and uh, please enjoy your day. And thanks for being with us. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.